I've been riding fixed gear for 10 years and saying that out loud is a little bit scary. And in the past 10 years, we've seen a lot of fixed gear trends come and go. Some of them were good trends. Some of them were just kind of dumb. And some of them might have even stuck around or are making a comeback. So my question to you is how many of these 2010s of fixed gear trends did you do? Speaking of fixed gears that have stuck around since the 2010s and are still going strong, this portion of the video is sponsored by Wobby Cycles. For a selection of track wheels that range from the bang for your buck, Wobby standard wheels, to the blingin' and bomb-proof H plus N archetypes laced to fill wood hubs, check out Wobby's wheels and components linked in the description to build the buttery bike of your dreams. So back when I was just getting into fixed gear riding, there was this huge obsession with track-specific components and track geometry frame sets that we don't really see today. It was like if you didn't have track components, you weren't a real fixed gear rider was almost the mindset or that track specific components were somehow better than non-track specific components. It was even to the point where it's like, oh, you have road drops on your track bike? That is disgusting. It was the silly purism and elitism that track specific components were somehow better even if they were objectively worse for street riding, which is where most fixed gear riders ride our bikes. When I started out, 23C tires were the norm. And if you weren't riding 23C tires, there was this idea that you were losing out on a lot of efficiency. A lot of people are running at least 28C tires. I very rarely see anybody on the fixed gear riding anything under a 25C tire now. Whereas 10 years ago, when I started riding, it was seen as kind of stupid to run anything over a 23C tire. Things have completely changed. Like when I got my first bike, just a Moda became track from Bikes Direct, 280 bucks, I still remember it, free shipping. That thing came equipped with 25C tires and I upgraded to 23C tires, which were buzzier, less comfortable, and got more flats. And nowadays we know that bigger tires, they're not terribly slower, if they're even slower at all. You can ride over more terrain, you get better cornering, and you get less flats. Big tires just seem like they're the way to go, and it almost seems cute that we thought otherwise. <laughs> and specifically, the go-to tire combination was a front 23C Vittorio Rubino with a rear 28C Vittorio Randonneur. Randonne? Rando. The Rando tire. Vittorio tires used to be super popular in the fixed gear scene. But nowadays, I mostly see two brands, Panaracer and Continental. Specifically, Continental Gator Skins, GP4000s, or even now 5000s, because the higher the number, the better the tire, I guess. Panaracer Gravel Kings and Panaracer Pacella PT, or whatever they're calling it now. And now, whenever I see somebody running a rear Rando and a front Vittorio Rubino, or Zafiro, <laughs> if you were really on a budget, it's almost like a throwback. We used to really like the Vittoria Randonne because it was cheap, it was really durable, and got very little flats, and you could skid on it for days. But the drawback of the Rando is that it's really sluggish, it's a really hard tire, it's not super comfortable, and it just makes riding the bike not a very supple or fast experience. <laughs> I feel like in the past decade we've switched over to other tires is because we don't need ridiculous amount of skidding in our tires anymore as we've grown up as riders and one can afford nicer tires than just what gives you the best bang for your buck and is the longest lasting tire that you could skid through for like six months to a year and two we've become more mature riders and don't skid ridiculously anymore the go-to wheel set was the velocity deep v and if you wanted extra fixie points and to make your bike look extra cool velocity b43 which they don't even make anymore and they haven't been making for the past like seven or so years <laughs> deep dish wheels were just the standard and it was like the fixy thing to do and velocity dv specifically were the go-to wheel set because one they looked dope which is the most important thing but they were also not super deep but still extremely durable and on top of that velocity wheels come in and came in a bunch of colors and patterns which were really in fashion back then. Nowadays, fixed gear riders tend to go for a more understated look, either just with black or silver wheels. And now the go-to track wheel set is the H Plus Sun archetype. It's shallower, not as eye-catching as Deep V's or B43's, and they only come in three colors, your favorite shade of 
black, silver, or gray. <laughs> we've matured. We've gone from wanting something that looks super dope, which we still like, but also now we try to balance it with something that's practical. More lightweight, but still durable. Something that makes the bike fun to ride, as well as still fun to look at. And speaking of H Plus on Archetypes, you can find them at wobbycycles.com. Go check them out, linked in the description. Get them to your favorite hubs. I like the Suzu Pro Maxes because they look super sweet. I'm still a fixing kid at heart. Like these, <laughs> I, I ride disco ball hubs. It's pretty sweet. Composite wheels like Aerospokes, HED, or Specialized Tri Spoke, or even the really sketchy Spinner G Rev X used to be like the the most desirable wheels that you could have on your fixed gear. Specifically because they look super cool. That's pretty much it. And while we still do occasionally see composite wheels on people's fixed gears, we've mostly moved away from them and gone back to traditional wheels because they're just more practical. They're more durable, they're lighter. Yes, even though these things are made of carbon, these things can be pretty heavy. They don't attract as much attention at lockups and they're just as fast. The only thing we're missing out on are just those sweet, juicy, delicious fixie points. People also used to mix and match wheels a lot. You know, back in the Day, we didn't have fixed gear parts as readily accessible as we do now. We couldn't just go to wobbycycles.com and buy a set of archetypes laced to Suzu hubs or Phil Woods or whatever. Like, if you wanted to upgrade your wheel set, and this is also because we were younger at the time and didn't have as much disposable income, but if you wanted to upgrade your wheel set, you were oftentimes looking at old road bike wheel sets, Nick in the front one and reselling the rear one. But even then, as we started to get more readily accessible fixed gear parts, a lot of people still ended up mixing and matching front and rear wheels. A lot of people would go with a more durable, a deeper dish rear wheel, because rear wheels tend to go out of true more than the front wheel and save weight on the front wheel and get a shallower dish wheel. But now that we have readily available fixed gear parts and wheel sets, we kind of just realized, you know what, that doesn't make that big of a difference, so why don't we just get the same wheels and then the bike looks better. Fixed gear riders also used to favor like super narrow rises, like the closer to your hands are to the stem clamp, the cooler it is. Because fixed gear riding was popularized by bike messengers who ride in pretty densely packed cities where narrow risers are really advantageous so that you can slip in between lanes of cars and packed traffic and gridlock. And that translated over to the rest of fixed gear riding. There's this idea that, yeah, I want to be able to slip through traffic just like a bike messenger, even though I live in the suburbs of Sacramento, California, where the lanes are giant. And there's also the idea that the narrower the bar is, the more aerodynamic it is, which is true. But we've kind of thrown that out the window, and now we really favor the wide bars, specifically because it's really fun, and that's really it. And wide bars are super impractical. You can definitely feel the drag when you're going against the headwind on them. This is one area of fixed gear riding that has become less practical, and it's almost weird now if you see narrow risers or even just shoulder width risers. But one handlebar choice where we have gotten more practical over the past 10 years is we very rarely ever ride track drops anymore. Whereas track drops were almost the standard drop bar that you would ride on a fixed gear just because it was track specific. We realize that track drops kind of suck because they're really narrow, i.e. really uncomfortable, but back then we thought of like, hey, that's aerodynamic. They're really deep, i.e. really uncomfortable, but hey, that's because it's aerodynamic, bro. And because the bend on them is so aggressive, you only have two hand positions, which are really uncomfortable, which is right next to the clamp or really deep down in the drops. Nowadays, a lot of fix your riders prefer road drops because they're a lot more comfortable and a lot more practical and come with more hand positions. It's just a win, win, win. The only thing that we're losing out on is that it's not track specific anymore, which we don't really care about anymore because there's tons of great components that we can put on our fixed gears that aren't track specific. Fixed gear riders also had this obsession with bar spins. Whenever we were shopping for a frame set, doesn't matter what kind of frame set it is, it doesn't, we, yes, we still want it to be, to have true track geometry, which is super aggressive, but then we also wanted it to be able to bar spin. Whenever a new frame set came out, we would always ask, but can it bar spin? Oh, it can't bar spin? 
Well, neither can I, but that's still a deal breaker for me. Like, when's the last time you saw a bar spin? Like, people are riding such wide bars that if they tried to bar spin, they would hit themselves in the groin with their handlebars. A lot of the desirable frames at the time had thick aerodynamic tubing, not because it was better performing or whatever, but simply because it looks cool. And back then, we just wanted the coolest looking bikes possible. Practicality be damned. So, Leader 725 and 735 were super popular. Bianchi Super Pistas or Pista Concepts, the Chinelli Mash frame sets, and at the lower end of the price range, there's even Visps and other leader knockoffs that were super popular. But nowadays there's a lot more desirable and higher end steel bikes that have become popular and aluminum bikes with round tubing. And again, I feel like this is another instance where overall fixed gear riders have grown up more and the scene isn't so super young anymore. And we want things that are a bit more understated, a bit more practical and things that are still super cool, but don't really scream for attention like thick aero tubing frames do. Another instance we can see that is there aren't a whole lot of bikes that are sticker bombed anymore. Yeah, some people still do it, but it was super popular to sticker bomb your bike and it was almost like if you are a fix your rider, that's just what you do to your bike. You just take it and cover your bike with all this branding and make it look like it's covered in trash. But as we've grown older and as our tastes have uh, matured more, we realize, oh, maybe I don't want to make my bike look like it's covered in garbage and I don't want to be an advertisement for a 200 different companies on wheels. <laughs> and as we've gotten more access to fixed gear bikes and components, we don't really see conversions a lot anymore. For a lot of people back in the day, converting an old road bike that you get from a swap meet or garage sale was the most cost-effective way to get into fixed gear riding. But nowadays, we have tons of choices for beginner fixed gear bikes that are pretty good and also affordable, diminishing the need for conversions. There used to be entire conversions and kits that were pretty popular and if off the top of my head I remember 8th inch which I'm not even sure is even still a company really thrived off of selling conversion kits and dress up kits for people's converted road bikes I mean pretty much their entire business model was selling cranksets bottom brackets and rear wheels to people that wanted to convert their bikes and saying that out loud, I am almost certain that they are not a company anymore. <laughs> Nowadays, people don't ask me how to convert a bike like when I first started my channel back in 2015. Now it's what is the best first beginner fixed gear that I should get off the shelf. And there's a lot of choices. You don't have to go scrounging around and have mechanical knowledge to start riding a fixed gear anymore. When that was really the case, 10, 15 years ago. I find it a little bittersweet because conversions were a great way to get a really nice bike, like a really nice frame set on a budget. And there's a part of me that wishes that people still did it more because there were a lot of unique conversions out there that fix your riders scoffed at because it wasn't track specific, but that were genuinely great bikes. Again, with this track specific obsession also came the tendency for fixed gear riders to judge people super hard if they were running brakes. It's like, oh, I ride a track bike with track specific components. You don't ride, you can't ride a brake on the track. I'm not riding on the track and there isn't a track in 200 miles from me, but I'm a, I'm a fixed gear rider and that's what we do. Like it was so really childish elitism that luckily we've grown out of and it's pretty normal to see people riding with front brakes even front and rear brakes on a fixed gear although there is still a part of me that is kind of disappointed when i see a brake on a fixture i mean look my bike my bike has a brake on it right now like it's not a big deal anymore <laughs> some people ride brakeless that's cool some people ride the brake that's cool too and possibly the biggest fixed gear trend of the 2010s that is even making a comeback a little bit is having really colorful fixed gears. Having a bike that looked like clown vomit was fashionable and cool. Then we moved completely the other direction and went black and silver components only to make our bikes look more understated and classy. But now we're swinging back to the other direction and we're starting to see a lot more colored components, specifically at the high end. Because colored components went from being cool to looking cheap and childish, and now they're cool again, because it's like 
If you want really nice color components, people know that a really nice anodization or a really nice paint job, it's expensive. And we've grown up to the point where we can tastefully add accent colors to our bike without looking like clown vomit. Let me know in the comments below how many of these fixed gear trends of the 2010s that you did, how many that you missed, how many that you really don't miss, and if there's any trends that I missed in this video. Let me know in the comments below and let's, you know, just be old people and reminisce about the good old days or the... I mean, honestly, these days things are better. The bad old days. <laughs> and speaking of the way things are better today than they were 10 years ago, this portion of the video is sponsored by Wobby Cycles. From Wobby's own meticulously hand-built wheels to the track lacrosse ready velocity quills to the ever-popular H plus one archetypes laced to your favorite hubs from Phil Wood, Grand Comp, DT Swiss, and my personal favorite, the Suzu Pro Maxes. Top it off with the most reliable tires from Continental and Panaracer, throw in an EAI cog in the flavor of your choice, and your favorite chain from KMC and Izumi, and your bike will make your inner fixie kids squeal with joy. So go ahead, check out Wobby Cycles and their component selection linked in the description. And Fixie famous shoutouts to Thane Berg, Brandon Black, David K, Gio DeZero, Julian Corona, Ryan Witzkopf, Longi, and Zen Kolnick for helping to make these fixie gear videos possible through their support on Patreon. And remember that life is short, but don't make it shorter. So ride your bike every day to be reasonably dangerous.